This is question 52 from section 3.7 on implicit differentiation. Label some things here, go 21A. Today is February 22nd of 2024. This is section 3.7, number 52. I won't give you the whole deal, but basically they say the graph of y squared equal to x cubed looks kind of funky looks something like this. I'm gonna draw it a little bit more extreme. Kind of does that, kind of does that. And this pen is not great. I can see why I didn't use it before. And so they're asking us to find, well, here's what they're asking us to find. They're giving you this equation and then they're saying, there's some line here And the equation of this line is y equal to one third x plus b. And their question is, find the value of b so that the line that you've drawn there with a slope of one third, one third seems wrong, negative one third, with a slope of negative one third intersects that curve in a right angle. That's all we're given. So you want to find b. So that the line drawn y equal to negative one third x plus b intersects the equation y squared equal to x cubed perpendicularly or orthogonally. I think they say orthogonally, but same deal. They say orthogonally. Orthogonal, perpendicular, right angle, they all kind of mean the same thing. So, different bench. what are they really asking us to do here? Well, what I think they're asking us to do, first of all, is to, or I should say, not what they're asking us, but what we need to do before we can answer their question is, we need to find this point of intersection here. And that point of intersection, the slope of the curve should be the slope that's perpendicular to the slope of this line. So if I look for the tangent line right here, if the slope of the line perpendicular is negative one third, then the slope of this line should be what? Yeah, positive three, because orthogonal or perpendicular lines have opposite inverse slopes. <clears throat> Another way of saying it is the slopes multiply the negative one. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the derivative of this equation and then we're gonna set it equal to three to find the point on the curve. We can either take the derivative implicitly, we probably should since we're in the implicit differentiation section of the textbook. Although I will point out, you could solve for y here. You could write y equals plus or minus x to the three halves and then take the derivative of the appropriate part and do it that way, but we're not. We're gonna do it implicitly. So implicitly, we say, well, the derivative of y squared is two times y times the derivative of y. The derivative of x cubed is three x squared. I'm perfectly frank, I haven't really thought through the answer to this question, so we might have to do a little work here. So what do I know now? Well, I know I want the slope to be three because that's where the lines will be orthogonal to each other. So for the slope to be three, I'm going to set my dy dx equal to three. So now I'm left with the equation two times y times three or six y equals three x squared or dividing both sides by six, y equals one half x squared, which is not enough information to fully determine what the point could be. The point could be literally anything. It could be zero, zero. It could be two comma two. It could be four comma eight. There's lots of points that would satisfy this equation. We have to remember that the point also has to satisfy this equation. So we're gonna try and find a point common to both this equation and this equation. The way I'm gonna do this is by taking what y is equal to here, and plug it in up there. So then I'm going to get 
instead of y squared equal to x cubed, I'm going to plug this in for y and get one half x squared squared equal to x cubed. One solution actually would be x equal to zero. We know that's not right though, because if you look at the graph, right, the line that goes through that point there is clearly not going through the point zero, zero. It's still a solution to the equation. To solve this, let's multiply it out. One half x squared squared is going to be one fourth x to the fourth equal to x cubed. I would try to make my life easier. I'd multiply both sides by four and say that x to the fourth is equal to four x cubed. I'd bring everything to the left-hand side and have x to the fourth minus four x cubed equal to zero, and then factor out an x cubed. You get x cubed times x minus four equal to zero. So my solutions are either x equal to zero, which we know is not the right one, or x equal to four. If x is four, then we can find, and we do need to find the y coordinate of the point here. So looking at this equation here, if x is four, then y squared is equal to four cubed, which means y squared is equal to 64. So y is equal to either plus or minus eight, but we know that we're above the x-axis from the picture. So y is gonna be positive square root of 64, which is positive eight. So the point of intersection is the point four comma eight. We're still not done because we still haven't answered the question, which is what does B have to be, right? Because we they said the equation of this line is y equal to negative one third x plus B. Now we have to find out what B is. Um, I would probably do it in a, I don't know, there's, there's like, I guess you could just plug in the point and solve for B. It's never my preference, but we could do it that way. I could say y equals negative one third x plus B is gonna become, well, if I plug in eight for y and four for x, eight equals negative four thirds plus b. So adding four thirds to both sides, I get eight plus four thirds, which is 24 thirds plus four thirds, which is 28 thirds. So that's, how, that's a kind of a complicated question, right? There's a lot of moving pieces here. We have to figure out what we're seeing the derivative equal to, set the derivative equal to that in our derivative, then to solve for the point of intersection. Questions about this example? It's a good question. I like it. Okay, um, let's see here. I know I said, so someone asked about related rates. Feel like, one second, before we get there, not that we can't get there. Yeah. So let's talk just a little bit more about the derivatives of the inverse trig functions before we then continue on to talk about related rates. Let me grab. So we got papers everywhere. Got things everywhere and not the thing I need. There we go. Yes. Cool. Good. That's what I was looking for. Um well, let's talk about last time for a second. You probably will want to memorize the derivatives of the inverse trig functions, at least four of them. So for inverse trig functions, there are three derivatives you want to memorize. The derivative, or at least in my opinion, we'll see, we'll see. The derivative of the inverse sine of x or the derivative of the arc sine of x, depending on which way you prefer to write it. Either way is fine, take your pick, is one over the square root of one minus x squared the derivative of the inverse tangent of x, or if you prefer the derivative of the arc tangent of x, is one over one plus x squared. 
And now here's where we're going to come to, well, well, we'll finish this off in a second. I'll point out, leave yourself some space below. We also have that the derivative of the arc cosine of x is negative one over the square root of one minus x squared. And the derivative of the arc cotangent of x is negative one over one plus x squared. So there's really nice correspondence between arc sine and arc cosine and arc tangent and arc cotangent. So now the question is, what about the arc secant function? And this is where things are a little bit weird, and I don't want to spend too much time getting into the nitty gritty of it because I don't think it's that important in the long run. So here's what I'll say. Just like with sine and cosine, and tangent and cotangent, not that we did all of this, but the idea is that you're taking some limited domain of your trig function, a domain where the function is passing the horizontal line test, and then inverting that so that we, come, so that we get the inverse function. Um, last time we didn't really get super into the details, but for example, for y equal to cotangent of x, the idea is that here's cotangent. I know, I know that's not secant. We'll get to secant in a second, I promise. Cotangent looks like this. It's got vertical asymptotes at pi and zero, and negative pi and every integer multiple of pi and looks something like that. It does the same thing. It has equal to zero at pi over two, negative pi over two and further on. It just keeps doing the same dance. Clearly not invertible on its own. It's not one to one. It doesn't pass the horizontal line test. If you, it's actually kind of funky. Oh yeah, this is a fun graph. So let me let me just show you something really cool because I think it's neat and it's also worthwhile. It's not just neat, I'm not just showing you the fun things. I'm showing you the, the neat things, the useful things. If we graph, oh yeah, I, yeah, Desmos Desmos is great. I'm really a big fan. So let's take a look at cotangent for a second, just so you all can see. It's kind of a wild graph, right? There's cotangent looking like we said, and if you want to, you could also plot like x equal to pi to see some of the vertical asymptoteness, right? x equals pi, or if you want two pi or three pi, you get the idea. So then if you wanted to graph the inverse function, let's turn this off for a second. Well, if you actually graph the inverse function, y equal to the arc cotangent, I hope is what it's gonna give me. Yeah, beautiful, lovely. On the other hand, if you just interchange the role of x and y, if you graph x equal to cotangent of y, look at that madness. See how it's really, really, really failing the vertical line test like a whole lot? That's why we have to restrict the domain so that when we draw the inverse function, it's actually a function. This thing I've just drawn or the Desmos has just drawn for us, clearly not a function because we didn't restrict the domain in the original thing, which meant we didn't restrict the range of the inverse thing. So we don't do that. We do that, we get something lovely. And now instead of having vertical asymptotes at y equals zero, sorry, at x equals zero and x equals pi, we have horizontal asymptotes at y equals zero and y equals pi. Kind of cool. So there's your inverse cotangent function or your arc cotangent function. Let me get this big again. So we take this section of it, which has a vertical asymptote at zero and a vertical asymptote at pi, and we write y equal to the arc cotangent of x, or if you prefer, the inverse cotangent of x. And then you see that as the x values get big, the y values get, or sorry, so the x values get closer to pi, the y values get closer to negative infinity. So we switch that. Now as the y values get closer to pi, the x values go to negative infinity. Similarly to the right hand side there. Not my best drawing ever. Desmos did it better, not surprising. Okay, so. Why did we pick this section here and not say like this section over here? Because this is the nicer section, because this has 
kind of the domain where you're picking the first quadrant, zero to pi over two, and then the one that's next to it that makes the thing continuous. You could have made a weirder choice. You could have made the choice like from negative pi over two to pi over two and had your like vertical asymptote in the middle or horizontal asymptote in the middle. It's not as nice. But at some point, somebody chose. And that's kind of the way it is. Now, let's look at the secant for a second. The secant's even weirder. So here's good old secant. Yeah. We did graph this before. I know it's been a little while. Secant of X also, no, not also. Secant of X has asymptotes at pi over two and three pi over two, negative pi over two. Basically, wherever tangent has a vertical asymptote, so does secant. And secant looks kind of like this. Secant of zero is one, and then it goes up, up, and away. Secant of pi is negative one. It goes down, down, and away. And just kind of repeats this the whole way through. Okay. So here's the question that there isn't an answer to. Which section are we going to pick to invert? And there are technically two correct answers. One of the correct answers, the correct answer that I feel like I like better, but I don't actually know because they're both good. I would pick this section. I would pick the section from, z from x equals zero to x equals pi. So I get this bit here and this bit here. That's what I would pick. And then if I invert that, my inverse is gonna look like, so here's how I typically think of it. All the X things becomes Y things and the Y things become X things. So instead of having a vertical asymptote at pi over two, I'm gonna have a horizontal asymptote at pi over two. And instead of having the point zero one, I'm gonna have the point one zero. Instead of having the point pi negative one, I'm going to have the point negative one pi. Here, x approaches pi over two, y goes to infinity. Switch x and y. Here, y approaches pi over two as x goes to infinity. Same deal up here. From the left, as x goes to pi over two, y goes down to negative infinity. Here, as y goes down to pi over two, x goes to negative infinity. That's my not really great drawing of arc secant. Something I want to point out about this. If you drew any tangent line to this graph, any tangent line, the slope would always be positive or negative. Looks like any tangent line would always be positive. Right. Or another way of saying that, an equivalent way of saying that, is this function is always increasing. From left to right, wherever it's defined, it's increasing here, it's increasing here. Or in other words, its derivative is always positive. Okay, hold that thought in your head for a bit. We'll come back to it. Alternatively, you could, well, in fact, let's, we'll, we'll come back to the alternative in a second here. So let's talk about the derivative of our secant, and then we'll, and then we'll come back to this page, and I'll show you something slightly different. So let's say I want to find the derivative of arc secant of x. So just like any time, oh, I don't, know, I, don't I, I hesitate to ask this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Have either of your professors talked about the inverse function derivative theorem, where you like take the derivative of the inverse function, you get one over f prime of f of something. Cool, great. We'll talk about it if we have to, but it's not, it's not my favorite formula because although it's useful, you can usually kind of bypass it to find the thing you're looking for. We'll talk about it if we need to, and definitely you should let me know if one of your professors does talk about it. If you see a one over f prime of f of something, that's the theorem I'm talking about. If you don't. But here, what we're going to do is we're going to let y equal the arc secant of x. And then just like the other 
two or three times we found the derivative of these inverse trig functions, we're going to rewrite this as secant of y equal to x. That is literally the nature of this relationship. If secant of y equals x, then y equals arc secant of x. That's the whole point. Y is the angle whose secant would be equal to x. Oh, look, y is the angle that if we take secant of it, we would get x. Same words, different expression. But now we're going to take the derivative of this. So we're going to differentiate both sides. The derivative of secant of some stuff is kind of the weird one. Derivative of secant of x is secant of x times tangent of x. Derivative of secant of y is secant of y times tangent of y times the derivative of y. Once again, the derivative of x is 1. And then we're going to solve for dy dx. So we're going to divide both sides by secant times tangent. So dy dx, the derivative of arc secant, is equal to 1 over secant of y times tangent of y. OK. So now I'm going to draw the triangle thing. I find it to be the nicest way of doing this. My angle is y. We are saying that secant of y is equal to x. So secant of y is equal to x over 1. And secant is some side over some other side. I literally don't remember. So I'm going to just flip it and say, well, the flip of secant is cosine. The flip of x over 1 is 1 over x. And cosine, I do know, is adjacent over hypotenuse. I guess I could have figured it out probably. So cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. Secant is hypotenuse over adjacent. And then we can find the third side using the Pythagorean theorem. One squared plus z squared equals x squared. So x squared equals, sorry, z squared equals x squared minus one. So z is equal to the square root of x squared minus one. Technically there's a plus or minus there and actually that plus or minus is, is is kind of weird in this situation. All right, so throwing it back into the formula, our dy dx is going to be 1 over secant of y, which is x over 1, times tangent of y, which is z over 1. But z is that, so it's a plus or minus. Yeah, I'm going to put plus or minus there, even though I don't like it. So typically, here's what people do. The way we have defined things with our choices that we made for our arc secant function here, we're going to say that the derivative of the arc secant of x is equal to 1 over, okay, everybody watch, the absolute value of x times the square root of x squared minus 1. How do we know this works? Well, we all said, and I think you all agreed with me, that this function always has a positive derivative. So no matter what x is, whether x is over here in negative or whether x is over here in positive, 1 over the absolute value of x, well, that's always going to be positive, times the square root of x squared minus 1, that's always going to be positive. This is always going to be positive. So that's one way of doing the derivative of the arc secant of x. And I think it's the way I prefer, but it doesn't really matter what I prefer. But this is not the only option. Some other people have decided, I don't know who, but someone. It's, and I think both cases are presented in the textbook or one of them is presented in the one like problem, an extra like homework problem. You could have made the choice instead, and this is where I think things get a little bit weird, we could have chosen to use this first same section here. So everything from zero to pi over two like that. But instead of using this piece right here, we're instead going to use this piece here, which I know seems super funky. I will point out, sorry, I'll point out my graph is not wonderful. I'll point out that our choice here still passes the horizontal line test. Any horizontal line I draw is only going to pass through at most one point. 
So when I invert this thing, any vertical line will pass through at most one point, which is the qualification for being a function. So now when I draw the inverse function here, and let's do it in red, for y equal to this other version of arc secant of x, it's going to look like, well, this first bit here is still the same. I still get the point 1, comma 0. Still have this asymptote here going this way. But then, oh, and I've probably, uh, I've written the arc secant in exactly the wrong place. How smooth. Um, over here, instead of starting here and going down that way, we're starting here and going up that way and having a horizontal asymptote of y equal to three pi over two. What a strange looking function. Why would you pick this? Well, the reason is, is if you pick this, when x is negative, the derivative is negative. And when x is positive, the derivative is positive. And so your derivative formula for your other version, you get to do away with the absolute value. That's why someone might make that choice. So, oh, sorry, apologies. You might want to see that, yes. Do you need to worry about this? Probably not. That said, your instructor might teach it to you and might expect you to pick one version over the other or tell you this is the version we're going to use. I saw kind of a half a hand question. Yeah. Why do you put x in front of it instead of using like the arc can formula? Because, well, when you say the arc can formula, what do you mean specifically? Like, I thought you used like arc secant or like on the bottom. Then, so, like, so like right here when I have one over secant of y times tangent of y? Well, so what I'm doing is I'm I'm saying I know that secant of y is equal to x. So I'm replacing that secant of y with x. And then for the tangent, well, I could do something complicated, but what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to say, well, I know that secant of y is equal to x over 1, is equal to x, is equal to the hypotenuse over the adjacent. And I'm using that triangle to help me find the third side so that then I can figure out what tangent of y actually is equal to. So here, getting z equal to the square root of x squared minus 1, then I can see that tangent of y is equal to the square root of x squared minus 1 over 1, or just the square root of x squared minus 1. So that's why I'm putting that there instead of something else. Well, I meant like the x to the side of the x. The x, this x here? And so remind me of your, what your question was again. Why is that x there? Well, because I've replaced secant of y with what it's equal to. Okay. And I've replaced tangent, replaced tangent of y with what it's equal to. Okay. Because when we're whenever we're finding these derivative things, we always would prefer to write our derivative using the same variable that we started with. We started with a function of x. We would like our derivative to also be a function of x. Sometimes it's not so easy to do, but usually we can. Um, the only other thing I really want to say about this is that, well, actually there's two things I want to say. One is a little longer. So now we can fill in, I'm going to go back to the first page here real quick. And now nope, I didn't leave myself enough room. We can fill in the rest of our inverse trig derivatives. So now we kind of know all of them. We know that, I'm going to write them again. I know, I know. The derivative of arc, sine of x is one over the square root of one minus x squared. And the derivative of the arc cosine of x is the negative of that. Similarly, the derivative of the arc tangent of x is one over one plus x squared. Derivative of arc cotangent of x. Wow, can I write letters? is negative one over one plus x squared. And finally, the derivative of the arc secant of x is one over the absolute value of x times the square root of x squared minus one. And the derivative of the arc cotangent, arc cosecant of x, not surprisingly, is the negative of that. 
And then the big caveat being, or if you defined it differently, the derivative of the arc secant of x could just be one over x times the square root of x squared minus one. And the derivative of the arc cosecant of x could just be negative one over x times the square root of x squared minus one. I don't want you to get too caught up worrying about that, but I didn't want to not tell you about it because it felt like it was a result. I, I don't want to lie to you. I'd be like, oh, there's this other thing you don't need to worry about. And it's, not that you, it's not that it doesn't exist. It's just that we probably don't care that much. The other other thing I want to say is that now we kind of know pretty much every function you might encounter and how to take its derivative. There are a couple other functions that are really not other functions. They just are labeled as other functions. But for example, now we could throw any chain rule version kind of question using this that we want. For example, I could say for f of x equal to the arc cosine of x cubed, what's the derivative? And then we're just going to do the usual thing. We know that the derivative of the arc cosine of x is negative 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. So the derivative of the arc cosine of some stuff is going to be negative 1 over the square root of 1 minus the stuff squared times the derivative of the stuff. And then I would probably simplify it or make it look nicer by writing it as negative 3x squared over the square root of 1 minus x to the sixth. Or we can make it extra, extra fun and ask questions like, what's the derivative of the arc tangent of x squared e to the x? And then we say, well, we know the derivative of the arc tangent of x is 1 over 1 plus x squared. So the derivative of the arc tangent of some stuff is 1 over 1 plus the stuff squared then we have to multiply by the derivative of the stuff. The derivative of x squared e to the x, we have to use the product rule for. The derivative of x squared is 2x, leave the e to the x alone, plus x squared left alone times the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. So every new function we learn how to differentiate, there's always the chain rule version of it, which is just replace x with stuff and multiply by stuff at the end of the day. It's a little funkier with secant because there's two places. It's kind of, not surprisingly, just like with the regular secant function, right? Regular secant, the derivative is secant of x times tangent of x. And for arc secant, the derivative of the arc secant has two instances of your x showing up. So sounds like it sounds like a song. Um, anyway, the derivative of the arc secant of let's say x times natural log of x. I'm going to use the absolute value version because that's the version I typically default to. It's going to be, instead of one over the absolute value of x times the square root of x squared minus one, it's going to be one over the absolute value of your stuff times the square root of your stuff squared minus one multiplied by the derivative of your stuff. Which then I'm going to actually have to write out because I decided not to right there. So that's going to be... The absolute value of x natural log of x times the square root of x natural log of x squared minus one in the denominator. And then on top, you're going to have one times natural log of x plus x times one over x, which is just one. If you really, really wanted to, you could simplify this one more time and write it as the natural log of x plus one all over the absolute value of x natural log of x times the square root of x natural log of x squared minus one. Kind of funky. Oh, you can't see that, I'm sorry. Yell at me, tell me, James, I can't see the thing you're trying to say. But every time with a new derivative, we're just saying, oh, replace the x with the new stuff. At the end of the day, multiply by the derivative of the stuff. Um, yeah, inverse three functions. One thing I will point out, because this is going to come back in 21B, there's a really, really beautiful connection between 
the derivatives of the inverse trig functions and how we do trig substitution in 21b. So later, I know it's a, I know it's a ways off, but when we get to trig substitution, I'm going to remind everybody, oh, because what you're going to see with trig substitution is when you see a one minus x squared, you're going to use sine. And when you see a one plus x squared, you're going to use tangent. And when you see a one or an x squared minus one, you're going to use secant. And I know we don't, there's not like, we don't really know the whole story of what to say there, but just trust me that knowing these derivatives is something you need to know, but it's also going to pay off later in that it's going to give you an extra little bonus knowledge for when you're doing trig substitution, which I think is cool. So it's worth, I mean, it's all, well, it's mostly all this. Some of the stuff is kind of like that. Um, I don't feel like there's a lot else to say about derivatives of inverse trig functions other than practice them, right? It's just like do some practice problems. There's, and there definitely are, I know, I still got copies of this handout here. If anyone wants to grab a copy of it, there definitely are some inverse trig functions on there to take derivatives of. So if you haven't grabbed the copy, I'll put these over here where they are. Definitely grab the copy on your way out. Um, I guess I should ask, are there questions about inverse trig functions before we start talking about related rates? Related rates. Like, what if we discover the oh, that's a good question? Like, I mean, you see, when you are you talking about like when we're thinking of this derivative here specifically, or just more generally with all these derivatives? With all of them. What have we discovered? I mean. We've really uh, discovered problem at that word. We've we've shown we found how to take the derivatives of the inverse trig function. So now we can add that to our catalog of things we're able to differentiate. We can differentiate x to any power. We can differentiate any regular trig function: sine, cosine, tangent, secant, cosecant, cotangent. We can differentiate e to the x. We can differentiate the natural log of x. We can differentiate x to the x. We can differentiate two to the x. We can differentiate any of these inverse trig functions. So I wouldn't say it's so much that we're really adding a lot to our knowledge base, but we're definitely adding another thing we are able to take the derivative of. Because eventually what we're going to start doing is, well, there's lots of things, but we might start trying to say, find the, how to maximize some function or minimize some function. And that definitely requires being able to take the derivative of that function. Kind of like we were talking about finding the maximum height of something and we took the derivative of the height function and set it equal to zero to find the maximum height. The same idea is gonna be true for functions that don't represent height, just represent anything. If we wanna maximize or minimize something, we're gonna take its derivative and set it equal to zero to be able to find where that maximum or minimum might occur. And we might be saying like, how do you, what's the maximum value of the arctangent of something for some useful reason? Yeah, okay. But yeah, I mean, to be fair, a lot of math, at least in my opinion, math is very useful. There's lots of great uses, but sometimes I like just doing math for math's sake because it's fun and interesting. I know that's not usually the motivation for people yeah. at this point, but sometimes math is just interesting, beautiful. That That's not to say there definitely are applications. I'm just not always great at knowing what they are or explaining what they are, but there are people who, if you all, who has to take physics? like almost everybody. So as you all know, there is there are also co-physics classes. Duff and Casey teach them. They're both wonderful. If you want to talk to people about applications, those are the guys. And they also do math. Like Duff and Casey both teach math as well, but they more do physics because we need, we have more math people than we have physics people. So they usually just get shuttled off into doing the physics stuff. But if you ever want to talk applications with people, those are your guys talking about. And definitely if you're taking physics, take the co-class. It's the physics. Physics is a hard, like math is hard here. Physics is like another level. I took the nine series way back when it was really hard. It's still really hard. So don't sleep on that. If you're taking physics 9A next quarter or, right? Cause I think you couldn't have taken it this quarter because I think 21B is a co-requisite for physics 9A. So if you're taking it next quarter or in the future, 
definitely look for the physics co-classes on the AATC website. There might be a, it might be a class, it might be a workshop, whatever. Sign up for it, go to it, learn the things. Duff and Casey are both very, um, they like physics a lot. They will talk to you no end about all the physics things you might want to talk about. All right, let's see. Anything else? AATC. The website is, um, you can just look for AATC, but the website is tutoring.ucdavis.edu. But if you just Google AATC, then you'll be fine. All right, let's look at some related rates. And the name kind of says it all, meaning we are literally going to be saying something is changing at some rate. And then we're going to ask, how is this related thing changing? Or at what rate is this related thing changing? Let's look at a very kind of typical example. Um, sure. Suppose the radius of a circle is increasing at a constant rate of two feet per second. And the question we're going to ask is, how fast is the area of the circle changing when the radius is equal to five feet? So they've told us how one thing is changing. They've told us how the radius of the circle is changing or what its rate of change is. And they're asking us what the rate of change of the circle is at a particular moment. So here's the kind of usual process we like to follow when we're doing a related rates problem. Sometimes you might draw a picture. The picture here is not super duper helpful, but it's not unhelpful. Here's that picture of my circle and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, right? So we're kind of, we're moving outwards. Circles growing. So we certainly expect our rate of change for the how the area is changing to be a positive rate of change because the area is definitely getting larger, not getting smaller. So what's changing? This question has a lot of answers, not all of which are helpful. Somebody tell me one thing in my picture that's changing. The area is definitely changing. What else is changing? Somebody else. Thank you. And I would, I'm glad for the, the answers that I was looking for, because those are the only things I really want. But I also point out, there's a lot of other things that are changing too. The circumference is changing. The diameter is changing. You could probably make up some other weird thing that's changing as well. Basically any attribute of the circle you wanted to mention is changing. But the ones we care about are the ones that they either asked us about or told us about. They told us how the radius was changing. They asked us how the area was changing. So those are the ones we really want to know. Great. What's the rate of change of the radius? They told us it was two feet per second. So here, watch this carefully. We're going to say that dr dt, the rate of change of the radius with respect to time, is equal to two feet per second. And the area, the rate of change of the area, is what we're trying to find. Important question. What should the units be on the rate of change of the area? Should it be feet per second? I don't think so, because feet's not a measure of area. Feet's a measure of length. What should I have instead of feet? Feet yeah, feet squared. Basically, whatever units you're already using, unless someone gave you something terrible where they like asked you the question in feet and or gave you the question in feet and asked for the answer in like yards, if, unless someone's trying to force some sort of stupid unit conversion on you, usually the units of your answer are just 
the same units you've been using with the right dimensionality. So if my question had been instead, some radius is increasing at two feet per second, and how is the volume increasing? The answer would be cubic feet per second, or that would be like my units anyway. You can always kind of just think about what the units should be. If it's a volume, it should be cubic lengths per time. If it's an area, it should be square lengths per time. If it's a length, it should be length per time. In this case, feet squared per second, feet per second, feet cube per second. But it could be per minute or hour or year, right? Whatever your unit of time happens to be. Great. We know it's changing. The next question we have to answer is to find an equation relating those two things. I should say relating the two non-time variables. Usually that's just going to be the geometric area equation or whatever geometric equation. Like if it's a volume, it's usually the volume of the shape. So here, the equation relating area and radius is area equal to pi r squared. And the next step is where people usually kind of get a little bit stuck. So the next step is to differentiate both sides with respect to the variable t. It's kind of like we're doing implicit differentiation. And when you differentiate y with respect to x, you don't get one, you get y prime. So same deal here. When I differentiate area with respect to time, I'm not gonna get one, I'm gonna get a prime. Or I would prefer to write dA dt. So there's my left side. On the right side, the constant pi hangs out. And everybody watch, the derivative of some stuff squared is two times my stuff to the first power times the derivative of my stuff. Pi times two times r to the first times dr dt. After we have differentiated both sides, then we plug in what we know, solve for what we want. Plug in and solve. So let's see. I don't know dA dt. I do know everything else. So dA dt. Now, usually I would not plug in units. Usually I would just plug in my numbers, get a number, then write the units at the end. But you can plug in units and say, okay, dA dt is going to be 2 times pi times r, which is 5 feet, right? They asked us, well, how is this changing when r is equal to 5 feet? times dr dt, which is two feet per second. Oh, look, the units are going to work out perfectly. I'm going to get two times pi times five times two, which is 20 pi. And I have feet times feet by seconds, so that's feet squared over seconds, which is exactly the units we said we should have. So at this moment in time, as the radius is increasing at a rate of two feet per second, the area is increasing at a rate of 20 pi square feet per second. But if we picked a different value for r, right, if we said, how is the radius changing when the radius is 10, then it would have been 2 times pi times 10 times 2. It would have been 40 pi feet per second instead of 20 pi feet per second. Sorry, 40 pi square feet per second instead of 20 pi square feet per second. So even though the radius is increasing at the same constant rate the whole time, the bigger the circle is, the more area you're going to increase by because you're like so far out and you a small change out here is much more area than a small change in here. Let me just get a little bit more area. Questions about this example? Don't worry, we're gonna do more examples. This is kind of our general format. Identify what's changing. Find an equation relating the non-time variables that are changing. Differentiate both sides with respect to time. That's not always, always the case. Sometimes you're talking about, like there's one example I've seen where instead of like say 
this thing is increasing as time goes on. You're saying like, as your elevation goes up, your pressure is decreasing and your volumes increase or something like that and doing it as your heights changing instead of this time. But almost always related rates are usually where time is the independent variable you're asking. How are these things, how are these things changing as time goes? Do you have a question, Jeannie? Sure. So the very last step here, like right here, the last one to plug in and solve. So I took my equation d a d t equal to pi times two times r times d r d t, and I plugged in my value of r equal to five feet for r, and I plugged in d r d t equal to two feet per second for d r d t. And then I was trying to find what d a d t was, right? I didn't know what that was, right? That's the thing that they asked me to find here. So then I said, oh, I have two pi. And I switched the order of the pi and the two because it's normal to write two before pi instead of pi before two. So I have two pi times five times two, and then two times five times two is 10 times two, which is 20, and the pi is still there. So I have 20 pi, and the units are feet times feet per second, square feet per second. Normally, I'll just point out, I wouldn't have written the units there or there. I would have just said I have two times pi times five times two, which is 20 pi, and then at the end, I would have tacked on the units which I knew were going to be square feet per second. You're welcome. Okay, let's look at some more examples. Ah, maybe. So, so I'll point out related rates, there's this whole kind of assumption or use of implicit differentiation kind of the whole time, right? You're always saying, oh yeah, everything here is implied, but not usually explicitly written, that everything is a function of t. I will point out, although I don't think you need to write this down to do this, we could have written in the previous problem that a of t was equal to pi times r of t squared. And then we differentiated both sides. The derivative here would be a prime of t, also known as dA dt. And over here, we would have had pi times two times your stuff, the first power, times the derivative of your stuff. But instead, we almost always prefer the Leibniz notation for related rates. I couldn't tell you why, other than I know it's true. Like, it's just, every, nobody writes it this way. Everybody writes it as dA dt equal to pi, times two, times r, times dr dt. Same stuff, just written in a way where it is implicit that r is a function of t instead of explicit that r is a function of t. And if you really wanted to last time, we could have said r of t is equal to two times t, right? Because we knew that dr dt was equal to two feet per second. So R of T can be two T feet and its derivative is certainly two, but we don't need to do all that. In fact, it's usually not in your interest to do all that. It's you're making more work for yourself doing it that way usually. Let's look at a new example. This one always kind of is interesting. The radius of a cylinder is increasing at three inches per minute. And the height is decreasing at four inches per minute. How fast is the volume changing? Before I say another word, what units can we expect the rate of change of volume to be measured in? Inches per minute, inches cubed per minute, inches square per minute, feet per minute, feet square per minute. What, what do we think the units are gonna be for this rate of change of a volume? Right, because it's the units we're already using, we're already in inches and minutes, but it's definitely a volume, which is gonna be cubic inches per minute or inches cubed per minute. So that's what we expect the units to be unless someone forces some other sort of dimensional change on us, like 
They say, and write your answer in feet cubed per hour, which would be a terrible thing to do to any. We're not going to do that, but I have seen things like that on actual questions where they make you change from like centimeters to meters or something like that. So just be aware if you're what the, of what units you're given and what units you're asked to write your answer in. It's not usually an issue, but I've seen weird web work problems occasionally. So just, just be aware. How fast is the volume changing when you have to be given a win? If they just say how fast the volume is changing, you can't answer that question because it's going to be different depending on how big the radius and the height actually are. How fast is the volume changing when the radius is eight inches and the height is five inches? And unlike the previous question, we don't actually have a good intuition here as to whether the volume is increasing or decreasing because the radius is getting larger, but the vol the height's getting smaller. So maybe it's maybe it's getting wide fast enough that the area that the volume is getting bigger, or maybe it's getting small fast enough that the volume is getting smaller. We don't know. We'll find out. Um, so here's my picture. And the usual cylinder with the height of H and the radius of R. And now the question becomes, what's changing? Or what are the things that are changing that we actually care about? And I would say that there are three correct answers here. We need all three of them. What's one of the things that's changing? The height, what else? The volume, what else? The radius, those are the three things. They told us how height was changing. They told us how radius was changing. They asked us how volume was changing. So that's what you always want to look for, is the things they've told you and the thing they've asked for. That might be a better way of phrasing it, but that's, I've always, my teacher was always like, what's changing? He actually used to say, identify the D what, D what's. The DRDT, the DHDT, the DVDT, the D something, D something. That's what he would always say. Identify the D what, D what's. So here we know that the radius is changing. So dr dt is going to equal three inches per minute. I don't really super care about the units there. The height is changing. dr dt is, oh, sorry, not dr dt. The h dt is, oh, where is it there? There it is. All right, anyone want to be brave and venture a guess as to what the correct thing to write for dh dt is? because it's not quite what's written on the page there. This is wrong. Why is it wrong? Right, because the height is decreasing. And if something is decreasing, its rate of change should be negative. Right, think about slope and derivatives. If a function is getting smaller, it's decreasing, its derivative should be negative. Its rate of change is negative. And then finally, volume is what we want to know about. We want to know what dv dt is doing. And we definitely know the units are going to be cubic inches per minute. Great. After we have identified what's changing, then we need the equation. Ideally, you would love for your equation to be involving just the variables you want and nothing extra. And almost always that's an option. The one exception typically is for cones. Usually with cones, you have either radius or height when you don't really want both of them. Usually, I'll, I'll, we'll do an example, you see what I mean. Um, but usually for cones, you have to do a little bit of extra algebra. So here, the equation for the volume of a cylinder is pi r squared, the area of the circle of the base, the area of the base, which is a circle, times the height. There's your cylinder volume equation. Great. Let's take the derivative now. So again, we're differentiating with respect to time. So on the left-hand side, you're going to get dv dt. On the right-hand side, we're going to have to use the product rule. Because you have, I would, I, for some reason, I like to like, plump my constant with my first thing. We have pi r squared 
times h. And both, uh, both pi r squared and h are functions of time. So the derivative of pi r squared is going to be 2 pi r times dr dt times h plus, now we leave the pi r squared alone, and the derivative of h is going to be dh dt. To make this a little easier for everyone to see it, I'm kind of thinking of pi r squared as my f, h is my g, and then here's your f prime, there's your g, there's your f, there's your g prime. Usual product rule. Now we're gonna plug in everything we know. Usually you should be able to plug in for everything that we, for everything except for the one thing we're trying to find. Sometimes that means going back to the original equation and finding a little bit of extra stuff, which we'll talk about also in a minute here. Um, so let's see, plugging in, I'm, I've got dvdt on the left and on the right hand side, I'm plugging in r equal to eight, height equal to five, dr dt equal to three and dh dt equal to negative four. So I'm gonna get two times pi times eight inches times dr dt, which is three inches per minute times h, which is five inches. Notice I didn't write, I didn't write any units, but it's eight inches times three inches per minute times five inches. That's inches, inches, inches. That's inches cubed per minute. So the units are looking right. Plus pi times my radius squared. Radius squared is eight inches squared times dh dt, which is negative four inches per minute. Again, units here also looking good. Inches times inches times inches per minute is inches cubed per minute. And then we do the math. I would certainly factor out a pi and then two times eight times three times five. Let's be smart. Two times five is 10. 10 times three is 30. 30 times eight is 240. And then over here, eight squared is 64. 64 times four is 256. Down. Yes. So I'm going to get negative 16 pi cubic inches per minute. Or if you used words to write your answer, you could say the volume is decreasing at a rate of 16 pi cubic inches per minute at that moment. Fives or S besides the mean? It's definitely not an S because where would S have come from? But, but your fair, to, fair question, because I know my numbers don't always look great, that is a five. So you have, so I have, what I did was I said two times five is 10, 10 times three is 30, 30 times eight is 240, and then eight squared is 16, 16 times four, okay, sorry, eight squared is 64, 64 times four is 64 times two times two, 64 times two is 128, 128 times two is 256. And then 240 minus 256 is negative 16. Okay. Also, it's not a crime to use a calculator. Just as a, I mean, like it might not be allowed on the test, but certainly in your execution here, it's totally fine to use a calculator to do some of the simplification. It's good to practice not using a calculator, but it's also fine to use that tool. All right, how much time we got? Got enough time to keep problems over. So let's look at the thing I was talking about when I referenced not always, sometimes having too many variables. Here's what I mean. So let's say we've got this situation. Water is being poured into a conical pool, a conical tank. Um, point down, right? It would be kind of weird. I mean, I guess you could have a conical tank where the point was up, but it seems less normal to me. Um, a conical tank where the radius of the tank is three feet and the height of the tank is 12 feet. And it's being poured in at a rate of three cubic feet 
per minute. How fast is the water level rising at the instant, the moment when the water is six feet deep? And as is typical, every time I do these kind of problems, I'm going to draw a picture of my sheet. Here's my code. Here's the water in the code. And so I'm gonna label a few things here. I know that the radius of my cone is three feet. I know the height of my cone is 12 feet. And then, as is usual, what's changing? Well, if I answer this in the I'm only looking at what they've told me sort of way, then the things that are changing that I should be caring about are the volume of the cone. They told me that the volume is increasing at three cubic feet per minute because I'm pouring in water at three cubic feet per minute. And I'm also curious about the height of the, I really should, I should be more specific here. I'm interested in how the volume of the water is changing, right? It's not the cone, it's the cone-shaped water that is in the cone. So I really want to know, how is the volume of water changing? Oh, it's increasing at three cubic feet per minute. And how is the height of the water changing? So I want to know how the height or depth, if you prefer, but I like height, of the water is changing. So what's dh, dt? That's what I want to know about. The thing that I don't care about, that's, but still going to come into play, is how the radius of the cone of water is changing. Right, because as the right, as the water level goes up, right, like if we go up to like a new height here, not only has the height of the water water increased, but the radius of the top level of the cone of water has also gotten larger. And that's something that always needs dealing with when you talk about cones. Just kind of a fact of cones. All right, so let's get an equation relating the things. And here's where the equation is going to be needing to get worked on a little bit. Our equation is going to be that the volume of the cone of water, you know what I didn't do here, which we're going to fix in a second? I didn't label anything, right? In the previous problems, bless you, I definitely labeled the variables, right? right the radius of my cylinder, we didn't know was R, and the height was H. And the radius of, or in my, my circle, same deal. Here, I do know the radius of the big cone and the height of the big cone, but the cone of water is what I'm actually interested in. So I should have really said, oh, my cone of water has a height of H and a radius of R. And so that the volume of the cone of water is one third pi R squared H. Kind of interesting geometric fact, I think, that a cone and a cylinder that have the same radius and the same height the cone is exactly one third the volume of the same cylinder. Kind of neat. I remember in like chemistry class in high school, my chem teacher had like a cone and a cylinder that were the same base and height. And you could take like, you could fill the cone up with water and pour it into the cylinder three times. And be like, oh yeah, they're exact that's exactly three times as much. Kind of cool. So it really is true that the volume of a cone is exactly one third the volume of a cylinder with the same radius and the same height as evidenced by the formula. But then we see problems. Because if I'm going to differentiate both sides of this, I could use the product rule like I did before. But then I would have to know how the radius is changing. And then nobody told me that. And I don't want to think about that. Here's a great thing to do instead. I'm going to draw this center line here. And I'm going to actually look at this similar triangle. But this is 3, and this is 12. And this is R, and this is H. You don't even really have to draw this picture. 
here's what you could say. The height is four times the radius. Look at those numbers. 12 is four times three. The height is four times the radius. Or the radius is one fourth the height. You could also like actually do some similar triangle stuff and say the radius is to the radius as the height is to the height. Say R over three equals H over 12. And then totally get one of these. Did I, did, did I do it right? I think I did. Yeah, R over three and H over 12. Am I getting the right equation? Yeah, I am. Yeah. So then you can get H equals four R or R equals one fourth H. So then I would love for there not to be an R in this equation because I don't know how R is changing. I know how H is changing. I want H's and V's. So I'm going to take R equal to one fourth the height and sub that in for the radius there. So I'm going to rewrite this as volume equal to one third times pi times one fourth the height or the height over four squared times the height. And then I'm going to multiply it out so I can then take the derivative. The volume is going to be one third times pi times one sixteenth times h squared times h, which is then going to be volume equal to one third times one sixteenth is one forty eighth. So I have pi over forty eight times h squared times h is h cubed. And now we're ready to take the derivative for the sides. This is pretty typical of cones, where you end up replacing the radius with what it's equal to in terms of the height. And you can always just say, oh, look, whatever this proportion is, is the proportion of radius to height. So if the radius is one fourth the height, then the radius is one fourth the height. Differentiate both sides, we get dv dt on the left. We get pi over 48 times three h squared times dh dt on the right. And then we plug in what we know, solve for what we want. In this case, we're plugging in three for the vol the rate of change of the volume and six for how high the water is. So if we plug in, we're gonna get three equal to, I should make a quick simplification here. Three and 48, I can reduce that down to just 16. So I've got pi over 16 times H, which is six squared times dH dt. I'll point out that the units are gonna work this three on the left is really three cubic feet per minute. This six here is really six feet squared. So you're gonna have cubic feet per minute divided by feet squared, which will leave you with feet per minute. But I don't really wanna write all that. I'm just gonna say it. So then solving here, we have three equal to 36 pi over 16 times dh dt. And then multiplying both sides of the reciprocal of this, I'm gonna have, three times 16 over 36 pi, and canceling out a three there, I've got 16 over 12, which reduces to four over three pi. That's what my dHdt is equal to. And I should throw on some units there, which is in feet per minute. Sorry, I know it's a little bit terrible. You might like to see the thing. Sorry. So I did two things. The first thing I did was just kind of set it. I said, oh, look, this height is four times this radius. Oh, yeah. But another way to do it is to actually use similar triangles and say, oh, look, the ratio of the smaller height to the larger height, h over 12, is equal to the ratio of the smaller radius to the larger radius, r over 3. And then you can cross multiply and say 12r equals 3h, or r equals 3 twelfths h, which is 1 fourth h. But typically, you can get away without actually writing down the similar triangles ratios and just be like, oh, the ratio here is this fraction of the height. Sorry, the radius here is this fraction of the height. So the radius is literally that fraction of the height. It always works that way, which is kind of weird.
So just for example, if I was giving you, and we don't really have time yet, we don't, we don't have time for another problem. But if I said, for example, some cone problem, and I gave you that the height of my cone was 24 inches and the radius of my cone was eight inches and you drew it, you didn't even have to draw it really, that's eight, that's 24. Then you could say, oh, well, the radius is one third the height. So the radius is one third the height. And that's literally the relationship. Or you could draw the triangle. You say, right, here's my big triangle, eight, 24. Here's my smaller, similar triangle where the height is H and the radius is R. And then you can say, and there's literally like four ways you can write these ratios. You can say H over 24 equals R over eight. You can say eight over 24 equals R over H. You could like, there's so many ways you can do it. But at the end of the day, you're always going to be getting this relationship, or if you prefer, this relationship. Okay.